Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Housing Equals Justice Conference. So this is the 18th Annual Training Institute and Conference uh, brought to you by the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. I'm Madeline Ravish, and I'm pleased to be introducing today's Shelter Diversion Training. And we're really excited about this session because Shelter Diversion is a really important tool for people out there to have to help people in their communities experiencing homelessness. So we have a great session for you today. A little bit about the Housing Equals Justice Conference. We developed this conference theme around our campaign, Housing Equals Justice, which cent centers on the issues of economic justice, racial justice, and criminal justice, three threads that run throughout all of our work ending homelessness, and which we are showcasing during the many wonderful conference sessions that many of you have been part of. Uh, we also are taking a good look at COVID and its implications for homelessness. We hope that you at the other sessions. We'll be running hour by hour sessions all the way through through Friday at five. So please do continue to join us. We've had over a thousand people register, thrilled at the response, and so happy to have so many of you here today. If you haven't already, check out our stores. This is the first time we've had a store, so we're pretty excited about it. I've got my mug right here, and uh, this is the same mug you see up there. Um, and so please do check out our store at the ATI website. You can just click on store to find the store. And of course, a big thank you to our sponsors, presenting sponsors, Bank of America and Zillow, who've made this whole thing possible. We're so grateful for, to Bank of America and Zillow for making it possible for us to offer this event to you free of charge, which is the way we feel like it should be. And also a special thanks to our workshop sponsor, CRT. So thank you, CRT, and thank you, Bank of America, and thank you, Zillow. And with that, I'm really pleased to introduce our presenter for today, Marcy Thompson. I will also introduce Diana Bruby from CCH, who is going to introduce Marcy. So welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us this morning. Um, Diana Barubi with Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. I am the program manager for prevention and exit strategies. And my work is focused on shelter diversion in Connecticut. But we're really, really excited to welcome uh, this morning Marcy Thompson. Marcy is the homeless services practice lead at ICF, uh, which is one of HUD's technical assistance providers. And she's going to present to you this morning on the practice of shelter diversion. Welcome, Marcy. Um, also, just a quick, um, you should see on your screen an option for Q&A. If you have any questions during this morning's session, please type in that Q&A box and we'll um, address those as they come in. Uh, we'll also uh, save about 10 minutes at the end of the session um, to address any further questions that you might have. Welcome, Marcy. Awesome. Uh, good morning. Uh, and thank you, Diana and Madeline, for that welcome and introduction. Um, and thank you also for giving me an excuse to wear my lipstick this morning. I feel like a, a normal human being again, so I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, today to be uh, presenting uh, to you uh, to talk about the practice of housing problem solving or shelter diversion. We'll talk about the alphabet suit around that in a moment. Um, I've been at ICF now for about three years. Uh, prior to that, I spent about uh, more than a decade at HUD. Um, but for the last three years that I've been at ICF, this has been a topic that I've been working on pretty closely with HUD and other federal partners to really help inform uh, federal and national guidance around, around this topic. Uh, we've talked to a lot of different communities um, and we've worked with a bunch of different communities around the country to help inform their own uh, housing problem solving strategies. And so I'm hoping to just be able to share some of what we've learned uh, over the years with you today. Um, next slide. Oops. All right, uh, actually, can you back it up one to the overview? Oh, sorry, go back to slide two. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Oh, technology. Um, all right. So today uh, we're going to be exploring housing problem solving as a tool that you can use to support clients in finding innovative housing solutions. Uh, shelter diversion is already happening and has been happening throughout the state of Connecticut. 
Um, in fact, uh, when we first started looking at communities, at what communities were doing around this topic, Connecticut was and really continues to be one of the places uh, that we've looked to for bright spots and examples. What I'm hoping to offer today is really just some updated thinking about housing problem solving can be adopted and adapted as an approach throughout your system, um, not just necessarily at the shelter front door, um, in order for it to have an even greater impact throughout your system. So I'll talk through some of the key elements and components, as well as share uh, how COC and ESG, including ESG CV funding, can currently be used to pay for this activity. Um, and then I'll also be sharing some community examples to just give, uh, um, help share some information about how other communities have started to implement this approach. All right, next slide. All right, so alphabet soup. Um, one of the um, things that I learned early on as we were starting to uh, explore this topic was um, uh, that a lot of people use the term diversion and everybody means something different. I think every community that I talked to uh, early on um, would use the term diversion, but often how it was being implemented looked very different. Sometimes uh, it was a person comes to the sh to emergency shelter. If we're able to prevent them from coming in even for a night, that is diversion. Um, if uh, in other places, somebody might stay in shelter for up to 14 nights and that is still considered a successful uh, diversion exit. So as we were kind of working through some of the initial conversations, we realized early on that we needed to come up with a shared set of definitions so that we could make sure that we were all talking about the same thing. Um, so I just want to run through that really briefly so that, so that we're clear when I'm saying certain things uh, that, that you know what I'm talking about. Um, so when I talk about housing problem solving, I'm referring to the set of techniques, to the approach, that are really, uh, that support the effective implementation of diversion and rapid exit, which is a slightly newer term, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so, di so housing problem solving is the practice. Diversion uh, is the strategy that helps people that are at risk or imminent risk of homelessness find safe housing options and is intended to prevent an occurrence of, uh, of homelessness at the point in which they're seeking shelter or seeking assistance from your coordinated entry, um, and, and they would otherwise be residing in a sheltered or unsheltered location that night or tonight. Um, rapid exit is the same practice. It's that same housing solving practice, except it is, it is uh, on the other side. So somebody has become homeless already, they may or may not already be engaged by the time you're having the conversation with them, but the key is that they're already, already experiencing homelessness, and so our goal is to exit them as quickly as possible. Uh, and so diversion is really intended to uh, reduce inflow, and rapid exit you can kind of think of as uh, increasing the outflow and helping people exit more quickly from your system. Uh, the VA also uses a term called rapid resolution, so I just want to, I won't talk much about that, but just wanted to, to raise it in case you've heard of it. So the VA uh, introduced rapid resolution in its uh, supportive services for veteran families program, um, and that really encompasses both rapid exit and diversion uh, and is intended to uh, assist veterans as soon as they become a uh, come into contact with the crisis response system. So bottom line, whatever you call it is fine. I, how HUD is gonna be referring to those activities is, is, is how I just um, talked through it, but whatever you call it locally is up to you. Um, so again, uh, housing problem solving is an equitable practice that involves strengths-based conversations to empower households uh, to help them to remain in either their current housing or to identify other uh, housing options, safe housing options, in order to avoid homelessness or to exit homelessness as quickly as possible. Um, it is an approach to client engagement that can be embedded into different interventions and throughout your system. 
All right, so what do we mean by a system-wide approach? Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is just community ABC. This is, this is not a, a, even an actual community. This is just a graphic representation of what it might look like. Um, I think in the past, in some communities, shelter diversion happens right at the front door. So somebody prevent, presents at shelter, they engage in a conversation, they are either diverted or they're not. Um, if they're not, they enter shelter and they proceed through whatever the standard coordinated entry process is at that point. So assessment, um, uh, prioritization, referral, et cetera. What I want for the takeaway on this slide to really be uh, is that because housing problem solving is an approach, it can be integrated throughout that entire process. So you might start a conversation when somebody first presents at shelter uh, and it, it may be successful and that's great, um, but maybe in that moment, we're not able to identify solutions. Uh, they may not be able to identify solutions. And so they're uh, going to, they're gonna maybe need to enter shelter uh, for tonight. Um, but let's, the next time we have a conversation with them and as we're engaging in case management, let's, con <clears throat> let's continue to use this problem solving approach in order to help support uh, their uh, exit from homelessness. So just again, just want you to see kind of that thread uh, that it can be a case management tool or approach that's used in shelter, that's used in your coordinated entry at all, in all aspects of your coordinated entry, as well as in street outreach. Uh, so just wanted to, to show that. All right, thank you. Um, just some overarching principles that I think are important to uh, keep in mind. Uh, these are kind of the things that I keep in mind when I think about the why, uh, why this is important, why this is a, a, an important strategy to adopt. Um, homelessness is a crisis. I'm sure that I don't need to tell anybody that's participating in this call today or in this training today. I don't think any of you need to hear that. We know that. Um, but I think sometimes it's important to remember uh, when somebody is presenting for assistance, uh, they are in crisis and um, they're in crisis mode. Uh, and homelessness is traumatic. So being empathetic in that moment and not kind of rushing to a solution uh, when it isn't immediately evident, I think is really important. Um, it's important to first focus on safety, de-escalation of emotions, and uh, really working with the person um, uh, to help them regain control over their circumstance. Um, they may not be ready, again, to fully engage right away, uh, but over time, uh, and if you continue to engage in this type of conversation, a different outcome might be possible tomorrow morning or even next week. Um, housing problem solving is all about client choice, empowerment, respect. Uh, it is an equitable solution. Uh, I was really excited to hear about the theme uh, in, the, in the conference this week. Um, this is definitely an equitable solution that can be offered to everybody. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of regardless of what assumptions we might have when somebody is coming into the system. Um, it's all about empowerment uh, and helping people kind of explore their own choices uh, by evoking and not instilling, by accepting and not judging. Um, it doesn't impose white dominant culture values or norms uh, on to people of color uh, and can give power back to those who have previously felt powerless. Um, our goal in problem solving is to help households that we're engaging with regain that sense of control by focusing on their own goals, choices, preferences, and really focusing on their strengths, which is a huge shift away when we think of coordinated entry about being, you know, all about assessing vulnerability and need. This is really about identifying their strengths and building from that. Um, progressive engagement Again, another term that probably means a lot of different things in different places. Um, I think here it's just uh, really intended to mean 
um, provide whatever assistance is necessary to resolve the housing crisis. Like what is going to keep them out of shelter today, tonight? Uh, what is gonna keep them off the streets um, that we're not gonna necessarily be able to solve everything? Um, so really kind of offering what is needed right now um, and then offering additional assistance as needed. Uh, but, uh, but again, really focusing on and, and believing in um, uh, the folks that we're working with in their own ingenuity, resourcefulness, and resiliency. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, which I think uh, is important to keep in mind, but not the only thing to keep in mind, is just around resources. Uh, even with the influx of, uh, of CARES Act funding into communities, there still are not enough resources to address uh, all of the very needs that communities have. Uh, and so I think um, here it's just um, how do we make sure that the shelter capacity that we do have and the permanent housing that we do have is available for those that truly have no other options. I, when I think of problem solving and I think of diversion, I think of what happens in the absence of, of those tools is a lot of missed opportunities. And so really, you know, how do we make all of our all of the resources that we have um, uh, just operate more efficiently. I'm gonna pause just briefly and just check with Diana to see if there's any questions or anything that I should be paying attention to. No, oh, thank you, Marcy. We don't have any questions yet in our Q&A box. Okay. Um, but I think and it's really important. I agree with you in that maximizing resources and it's not just financial assistance, but really knowing your community at a, a local level and knowing what's available to you um, that you can refer these clients to to help them find stability in, in housing. And I think that you must have read my mind because I am going right into this idea of no one size fits all that I think um, even when I share later some commun other community examples, I think it's really important to, to learn about what other communities are doing or what other providers are doing, but it's really important to think about how this can fit into your system based on the resources that you have locally, uh, both um, from a funding standpoint, as well as what community partners you have at the table and that are willing to participate. Um, you know, and also how your coordinated entry is set up. In some places, coordinated entry is uh, uh, co-located at your emergency shelters and in other places it's not. So, I mean, I think that there's all of those considerations that should come into play. Um, so really kind of knowing what the fundamentals are, uh, what some of those shared or common elements are around problem solving, and then tailoring it to your community. Um, and understanding that it's gonna evolve over time, that what you set up today, you're gonna to learn and you're gonna to continue to improve and build upon it uh, over time. All right, next slide, please. All right, so um, uh, just want to reiterate again, this idea of a continuous conversation um, that, you know, it, it in an ideal world, this could be a conversation that builds off each other, you know, even if it's not the same caseworker that's meeting with the, with the household. If there's a way to track, uh, track notes in HMIS so that the next person that's talking to them can kind of build off of whatever has happened. Um, but, the, but the goal is to keep pulling at those threads, to keep kind of um, exploring those options that may have felt completely not viable uh, until maybe they're, you know, they, they might become viable and figuring out what needs to happen in order to make that possible. Is it a conversation with a family member? Is it, you know, mediation with the landlord? Or is it some sort of financial assistance that is needed? Um, in talking with HUD, they have kind of talked about these three outcomes um, uh, that I just want to mention briefly because I think it's uh, just important uh, in kind of the, the different ways, uh, um, especially in thinking about funding, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
So the first outcome is we have a housing problem solving conversation. That and connection to other resources in and of itself is enough. Uh, you're able to reconnect the household uh, back with friends or family. You're able to, to um, have their landlord allow them to stay, work out whatever the arrangements might need to be, but no financial assistance is required. So it's really just um, the provision of, of the services and whatever staff time is associated with having those conversations. Um, if uh, uh, the second outcome would be the, the conversation is successful, you've identified a viable option, there's a place where they can go, um, or they're able to um, get their own place, but in order for that to be secured or that to happen, they're gonna need some sort of assistance. So it could be, we'll talk about this more in a minute, you know, it could be um, you know, rental arrears, it could be just a, a security deposit, um, or it could be some more creative uh, financial assistance options as well. Um, but, but that outcome number two is really, um, building off the conversation alone. So it's the conversation with services and this time limited, probably just one time uh, financial assistance that's being um, that's being offered. If that doesn't, if that doesn't work, so the conversation has not yielded any sort of immediate uh, housing options, uh, the person is going to then proceed the same way that anybody else would. So maybe it's they're entering shelter, maybe it is, um, maybe they're already in shelter and they're gonna be in, uh, enrolled uh, into your coordinated entry process. Really whatever your system is set up like, they're gonna kind of go forward. What I think becomes different is currently how most systems uh, that I've observed are set up is, again, there's that point of, Yes, they've been diverted or no, they have not. And if they have not, they proceed, they're assessed, and then they wait, they wait, they wait, they wait for a very long time, uh, especially if they're not gonna be uh, prioritized for any sort of uh, permanent housing resources. And so the idea here is you're gonna continue to have those conversations. Um, and ultimately in that, that third outcome, um, either, one of those conversations will lead to a successful uh, rapid exit uh, solution that will either be uh, just with that staff support in case management services and problem solving conversation, or may also uh, uh, require some of that financial assistance, or it might be that they are prioritized and they're able to get a referral and match to a permanent housing resource. But either way, until that person is housed, you continue to engage and continue to work with that, with that household. All right, uh, you can go up one more. Can move forward one more, thank you. All right, so we can go back to services. Um, okay, so I think uh, I'm not gonna cover this too much, but just, I think it's important to share kind of what are what are most communities doing so when we talk to different communities that are offering or that have diversion or problem solving whatever they call it locally what does that mean um what does that mean um, and we definitely have seen some core components regardless of where or how it's being implemented in the system in terms of what's being offered uh, so the most critical component of housing problem solving is the, that person-centered exploratory conversation that is really just an element of strong case management, of strong housing-focused case management. Um, the services that might go along with that conversation to help secure housing uh, could include housing search and navigation, landlord and family mediation, conflict resolution, um, uh, as Diana mentioned earlier, connection to those community, other community resources and other community partners, crisis resolution, um, legal aid, credit repair, et cetera. Um, and this list up here is not at all exhaustive. It really does depend on what you have available locally. I think that's gonna also depend, will also depend how you set up who is gonna be served, 
uh, who's going to, you know, who you're going to target for this intervention. All of that will be dependent upon your, uh, your community and what you have available. All right, next slide. All right. Um, <clears throat> there's also a variety of financial assistance uh, types of costs that can be, uh, yep, uh, that can be provided to households. Again, no one size fits all. Um, this list up here, you know, I want to just also be clear, this list doesn't mean you have to offer all of these things or that you only offer these things. It's really up to uh, what you have available, how much, how much you have available, uh, and how much you want to be able to make available to each household, etc. The key is that for any of these costs, uh, it's a one-time or very time-limited level of assistance um, and should only be offered as a means of directly securing housing. So, you know, the, the, we're, we're, we're gonna provide this support uh, because by doing so, you will be in housing today or tomorrow. It, it's, it is really that direct of a link. Um, we're not attempting to solve everything. We just want to make sure they're getting back into housing so that they can then continue to work through the other challenges that they may be facing. Um, so as you're kind of thinking through your uh, local policies and procedures about how to, how to operationalize housing problem solving, you'll need to make decisions around how much assistance can be offered, for example, per household. Can they receive such assistance more than one time a year? Um, you'll also want to think about, again, that, that targeting and eligibility. I will say, you know, I would definitely encourage you to not add any criteria that is not required by the funder. Um, you know, you can, you can target and prioritize, et cetera, but don't make it harder than it needs to. Just make sure that whatever, uh, whatever kind of policies you have in place, especially around decision making, um, are clear and transparent and um, are ensuring that, that everybody or that decisions are equitable, um, that it isn't up to case manager A to decide, well, I really want to help this person a lot, so I'm going to give them all of this versus somebody else that, um, that, that uh, might not be as, as generous. Uh, so really just making sure that we're uh, being judicious about, the, about how those decisions are being made. Um, I think, it, and when you have flexible funding sources and you're able to be, uh, and you're able to be creative, go for it. Uh, be creative, be non-judgmental, be as flexible as possible. Don't place you know, your own values onto what that person identifies as the thing that's gonna help them um, get back into housing. Um, all right, next slide. All right, so this is a very massive chart that um, I expect you all to memorize in the two minutes that I talk through it. Uh, all right, so this is really intended to just be um, if you were gonna use COC and ESG funding uh, to begin integrating housing problem solving into your program or into your system, you can do that now based on existing rules, based on existing um, um, funding availability. Uh, and there are some limitations with any federal funding and I'll talk about that in a second, but I, I think uh, knowing how to utilize the funds is, is always helpful. Um, when it's possible, again, to have flexible funding, that's great, but you don't have to wait until you have this, all of the things in place uh, in order to get started. You can get started with what you have uh, right now. Um, so if you're thinking about the first out use outcome, like I mentioned earlier, where it was just the, the problem solving conversation uh, and light touch supports and community connections were enough to, to resolve the crisis, um, then we're probably just talking about staffing costs. Um, and that could be staffing costs in your uh, COC funded coordinated entry grant. 
It could be in another, like a street outreach uh, grant funded uh, as an SSO under, uh, S under COC program, sorry. Um, and if we're talking about ESG, uh, those could be costs within your street outreach program or in your emergency shelter. Um, if we're talking about financial assistance, uh, where financial assistance is required, so this is really just a list of um, both the, some of the costs that I identified in the last couple of slides and what is eligible within these two, pro within these programs, um, which, is, which is quite a bit. Um, the idea is that, or what HUD is recommending, uh, it's that communities think about carving out some portion of these funds. So maybe these funds start to sit with your coordinated entry uh, entity, you know, whoever is your designated um, entity that's, that's doing coordinated entry so that they have direct access to be able to enroll uh, somebody in homelessness prevention or rapid rehousing um, because uh, they don't have to go through in order for this uh, to be as immediate as possible, they don't have to go through the normal uh, coordinated entry assessment uh, process. You could enroll them immediately as long as it's a part of this housing problem solving uh, intervention, either as diversion or rapid exit. So thinking about how to do that with, um, uh, thinking about how to do that might be helpful if it's, uh, it could be streamlined again if you are able to identify a single ent entity to administer those funds as opposed, of, as opposed to needing to make a referral to a project and then kind of go through uh, that whole process. Um, so just a couple of quick nuances and then I do see there's some Q&A so I'll pause for a second and see where we are on that. Um, so just the case management costs in this framework uh, really refers to any of the interpersonal elements related to housing problem solving. So it could be staff to client conversation, that family or landlord mediation, conflict resolution, housing navigation, et cetera. So all of that staff time, um, uh, including any sort of documentation requirements uh, is all kind of falling under that case management. Um, line item. For rental assistance, um, at least at, at, based on, on existing rules uh, and requirements, um, where rental assistance is provided, uh, so uh, HUD has said or is saying, you know, you could provide up to three months of rental assistance. It's up to the community if that's even something that you want to offer. But, you know, if you're going to use COC funds for this or ESG funds for this purpose, it would need to be limited to up to three months. Um, so any of those rental assistance costs, they do come with the caveat that there needs to be a one year lease between the tenant and the landlord um, rent rent payment standard applies. So for, um, for ESG, uh, that would be up to the FMR. For COC, it would be rent reasonableness. And there is a housing uh, inspection requirement. Um, so really, if you're gonna use these funds for any of that, any sort of rental assistance costs, it's really only talking about getting somebody into their own unit. We're not talking about, we're most likely not talking about going back and staying with friends and family, unless we're talking about like a shared housing situation, for example. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and see what Diana's got for me. We do have a few questions. Um, one in regards to how COCs are tracking data in HMIS, which is our homeless management information system, our database. Um, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Marcy, or if you want me to answer that one. Uh, I would love for you to answer that one, because I, I will sure. say I think that it varies from community to community. Some communities are using Excel. Um, HUD did put out uh, the new coordinated entry data elements, which, in, which includes a, a problem-solving event. Um, but I, I definitely think that is an area where communities are doing it very different. How are you yeah. guys 
In Connecticut, we will be moving towards a problem solving event in HMIS. Currently, the data is tracked at the initial call to 211, um, whether or not a household is able to be diverted or not. And then again, at the coordinated access um, assessment that happens, which what was happening in person um, within each of our coordinated access networks, um, most are happening uh, virtually or by phone at the moment. But that data will be tracked um, again at that initial um, assessment. Um, there's a, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think, you know, I've seen some communities set it up as like a coordinated entry event or like as a coordinated entry assessment. And I've seen other communities that have set it up as a new project setup. I think I, for now, until there is clear guidance and direction, um, I, I, I think you figure out what kind of works for you locally and, um, and, and know that that's going to evolve over time as you, as you continue to implement. Um, another question here um, looks like a specific case of a family that um, someone has come into contact with um, in regards to a landlord legally forcing a family to leave a unit. Um, so I don't know if you want to very briefly, maybe we can go into the uh, federal more on evictions at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there is the, the federal eviction moratorium around um, uh, not being able to evict uh, households, especially or for non-payment of rent, uh, I believe. Um, and in addition to that, I think that there are probably local and state laws that are also, that are layering on top of that as well. Um, so I think, um, Diana, I don't know if you want to add more in terms of what's happening in Connecticut, but I feel like that's a pretty local. Yeah, um, so the CDC's federal um, moratorium on evictions is lasting straight through December of this year, um, but our governor has also um, put in a, a, another layer, as you said, of uh, moratorium on evictions in Connecticut, and that is for non-payment of rent, um, meant to help those households that have lost employment um, and are, are not able to pay their rent. Um, we encourage folks, obviously, to continue to pay their rent because we recognize that when the moratorium is over, that they're still going to be in a situation where they're gonna um, have to face an eviction if they haven't paid rent over this period of time. So that's that's important to note, I think. Yeah, and the other thing I would note is it's definitely coming up a lot in the, um, the HUD AAQ around um, prevention, you know, when is prevention assistance allowable for, for folks that are under the moratorium? And, you know, I think, um, uh, the challenges is that if you're if you're basing it off of the eviction or uh, notice of eviction, they don't have a notice of eviction yet. There are other categories of eligibility uh, under the at-risk definition um, that may apply to the family. So you could certainly uh, explore those. But in terms of thinking about um, the, the element under the at-risk definition related to eviction specifically, it, folks that are under the eviction moratorium and don't uh, have to leave, I think um, uh, it's, it's a very gray area, so uh, it's tricky. Yeah, yeah, we're experiencing that here as well. Yeah. So, the, you know, noting that financial assistance is only available to those that are right at that front door of homelessness and, and really on the brink of experiencing um, homelessness in itself. Um, certainly the eviction moratorium provides us with a little gray area in those, yeah. those, those uh, circumstances. All right. Um, should we keep going? Yeah, I think so. Um, we do have a, a few more questions, but we can get to those in a little bit. Okay, awesome. Uh, all right, so next slide, please. Um, 
All right, so just briefly on staffing, you know, I mentioned kind of how staffing costs universally would be an eligible cost, but I think just in terms of how you're staffing, again, done differently in a lot of different communities, um, you might hire all new staff that are dedicated to, to just doing housing problem solving, or you might train all of your case managers or and all of your outreach workers to be able to engage. Um, you might also start to uh, do some um, cross training within the community to other, other community partners that are, are engaging with the same folks that are presenting to your system. So there isn't any sort of right uh, staffing model here. I think it really, again, is dependent upon um, what, what works and is set up. I think the most important thing uh, is thinking about the critical skills. So critical skills for engaging in problem solving include that empathy and active listening, um, having an understanding of what's available so that you can immediately start to make those connections of what else they might be eligible, eligible for and who you might be able to do a warm handoff with. Um, conflict resolution and mediation, uh, recognition of implicit bias uh, and, um, and doing our best to not let our own bias and judgments impact the, uh, how we're going forward with, with a client. Um, and the ability to elicit ideas rather than instill ideas and solutions, which I think is really critical. Um, uh, what I mean by that is the uh, not telling a part of the household what the solution should be, but really kind of engaging in a conversation in a way that they're able to identify it on their own so that they're able to own, own their uh, uh, um, own the solution um, and, and have that empowerment. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so just, um, this is a shift in approach, maybe not in Connecticut where you guys are already doing this at your shelter front door, <clears throat> but it could be a shift in the approach within shelter um, or in other parts of your system. Um, it's changing the way that we do business. So we're moving away from assessment that's solely uh, intended to understand a person's need and vulnerability to having these conversations that are really focused on understanding their strengths and their natural supports. Um, moving away from um, uh, this, let's do an intake and place on a wait list to let's really focus on crisis resolution uh, and moving away from, are you willing to enter shelter to what can we do from, uh, what can we do to keep you from needing to enter shelter? Because shelter, no matter how wonderful your shelter is, is not a place that we should want anybody to have to be. Um, so, you know, how can we keep you from entering shelter or, or being unsheltered tonight? All right, next slide. Okay. Um, so just uh, thinking about the conversation itself and how you're engaging, um, the, the biggest, my biggest recommendation when I, a lot of communities will reach out and say, is there a template? Is there a set of questions that we should be asking? Is there a checklist that we should be filling out? And I always just say no, that it is, you know, I, I am willing to kind of share what I think other communities are doing, but I, I want to move away. I feel like that honestly is one of the challenges that we've seen with coordinated entry as we've gotten into this space of, um, of you know, concrete set of questions and it's if this, then that. Uh, and I think with problem solving, we really want something to be more organic where it's really focused on open-ended questions that build off of each other. So that ability to um, have active listening where you're able to start to identify things that you can probe further uh, and explore further. Um, creating a comfortable and safe meeting environment, which, you know, as Diana mentioned, I think a lot of places at this point are doing virtual. So really thinking about how to use technology in a way that um, is going to be um, uh, comfortable and, and help folks feel safe uh, to engage. Uh, being clear, clear and transparent about what people can expect. Um, being clear and upfront about 
what, uh, what resources may or may not be available. Um, uh, just trying to think about what I haven't covered. Um, and displaying open and responsive body language, I think is also important, hard right now on Zoom. I'm talking with my hands a lot because I like to do that. Um, but I think, you know, the biggest thing is uh, creating a space where it's a conversation. It is a conversation. It's not a, we're just trying to get you through this step and then you're going to go on to somebody else. Um, so, <clears throat> and then listening without judgment, which I had talked about before as well. All right, so I want to just jump to a few of the community examples quickly. Uh, I think just the framing here, um, and you can go to the next slide, uh, is every community is different. Um, every community is exactly, I always say, every community is exactly the same, and also every community is different. Um, and the, uh, so I think as you guys are thinking about if there are whether if you're from Connecticut or you're from any community and you're thinking about adopting or adapting your housing problem solving approaches, I think it's really helpful to learn from what communities are doing, but every community is, is evolving. This is still a new practice. It's still a pretty new concept. Uh, and so I think uh, learning but not copying is really important when we're thinking about peer to peer sharing. Um, so Seattle, uh, King County, uh, Washington, they use the term diversion as their universal term. Uh, they uh, focus on um, assisting folks that are already experiencing literal homelessness or who are attempting to flee domestic violence. And homeless status is really the only eligibility criteria that they have in place. Um, diversion is available at any coordinated entry access point, so it includes shelters, day centers, encampments, outreach programs, etc. Um, they have a central diversion fund, which was established in 2018, um, and through that they're able to provide some flexible financial assistance. Uh, I think one of, um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight uh, that they're doing in Seattle, King County, that I think is really interesting and, and unique um, is there, they've really been focused on taking diversion to scale throughout the system by pairing equity driven training um, that is uh, provided uh, by uh, what they refer to as coaches. Um, and the flexible financial assistance is administered by this source. Um, the region has commit has a commitment to integrating anti racist prin principles throughout the system's response. So the diversion co coaches are selected to reflect the community that is experiencing homelessness and included among the coaches are people with lived experience and lived expertise. Um, the, the program's use of an inclusive process for selecting um, a nonprofit administrator uh, was led by an or uh, led to the selection of an organization. Um, that is led by, uh, by people of color and it predominantly serves the Black and African American community. Uh, and so even though this particular agency had less experience, it was really important that they be selected uh, because they really met the objectives of the fund. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and I just, the one thing about Seattle is that they do problem solving or diversion with both individuals and family households. Um, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania uh, also uh, provides um, uh, problem solving to both individuals and families. Uh, they really focus a lot on crisis resolution, progressive engagement, uh, maximizing community resources, uh, and um, they, but they also do a lot of eviction prevention. That's been a big component of their system. You know, you think about um, Montgomery County PA versus a Seattle and the demand in terms of just homeless populations. And I think that gives an, an example of how community context can come into play about how you're, uh, you're, you're targeting your resources. Uh, so um, they start with a conversation uh, at shelter and if, a household can't be diverted through that conversation, 
they go into emer a person would go into an emergency shelter, but those problem solving approaches do continue uh, and uh, throughout the next phase. They use a phased assessment approach, uh, which this would certainly be a part of. And they're assessed using their, um, their coordinated entry assessment tool and they're placed in the community queue, but they continue to engage in that problem solving, um, whether it's in shelter or their outreach workers. So their outreach workers are also trained and are expected to provide housing focused services um, uh, while they're engaging with households. Uh, I think, uh, their effective problem solving is very time intensive. So I think they're one of the key takeaways for them has been that staffing is the primary operational expense as opposed to financial assistance costs. Uh, and they noted that it's that uh, intensive staff time to really be able to help households appropriately resolve their uh, housing crisis is really important. Um, the last thing I'll say for them, one of the things that they have noted Identifying a local champion within the community to bring together the essential partners is always really important. I think the key to any effective problem solving strategy is that it is implemented throughout the system and it's not one single provider that's kind of operating on their own. If folks can go to everywhere else and it's a different conversation, a different approach, I think it just might not be as effective. Um, I, I'll maybe talk about one more community. Um, the others are kind of included in here for you, but then I, I do want to give a couple minutes for questions. Um, so maybe um, move down to um, Columbus, which is, uh, we've got Washington DC is next. Keep going, keep going, one more. All right, so Columbus has been um, doing a lot of work uh, to strengthen their uh, diversion, problem solving, prevention efforts, uh, really since uh, 1998 when they were, do you remember 10 year plans? I don't know if folks uh, who's, who's been around long enough to remember the 10 year plans, um, but, but really during that time there was a, definitely highlighted the need for more formalized access to emergency shelter. Um, but also access to other community resources, that there needed to be this, this, this more community system response. Um, the community recognized the need to stem inflow into the homeless system, uh, and so there needed to be coordination regarding prevention assistance. Um, it wasn't, so even though they've been thinking about this for a long time, it wasn't until uh, 2018 that they really started making significant pro progress when thinking about uh, problem solving approaches like diversion, rapid exit, targeted prevention, et cetera. Um, so they uh, really focus on, uh, again, individuals and uh, family households. They have targeted programs for specific subpopulations at greatest risk of literal homelessness. Uh, they um, uh, administer the assistance through a homeless hotline. So as opposed to folks that are showing up to the front door, they're, they're doing it through a call, a, a hotline that operates 24 hours a day, uh, and they receive 100,000 calls annually. So that is a lot. Um, so I pause there. Uh, these community examples are going to be turned into some larger community profiles uh, with HUD. So uh, you'll be able to get a little bit of information in the slides and then forthcoming uh, will be some, some more more details, so. So that is one of our questions uh, that's shown up a couple of times here in the, in the Q&A, um, availability of the slides for future use. I will say that this workshop is being recorded and will be available on CCH website um, shortly af after the ATI uh, is over. Um, another question here is in regards to the use of um, rapid exit funding, um, how that's being utilized in other parts of the country. So in Connecticut, most of our rapid exit 
happens through a rapid rehousing provider versus the case management directly at a shelter. So I think the question is posed is, how is that working in, in other parts of uh, the country? Yeah, I mean, I think that is, uh, because rapid exit is still pretty new and honestly, um, there hasn't been a lot of guidance yet coming out from HUD around how to do this. So I think a lot of communities are still kind of in a, a space of, if they're using local funds, you know, they're uh, maybe having folks that are staying in shelter for a period of time and they're still counting that as a prevention uh, exit or a diversion exit. And I think that's really the point of, of clarifying the terms so that we're all talking about the same thing. So I think with rapid exit, it would be, um, at least from HUD's perspective, you would use your rapid rehousing funding, either ESG, ESGCV, or COC funds. And I think the idea is that it would ideally be a carve out where you have a central administrator, and it could be a, a single organization depending on your COC, or it could be, for example, in Connecticut, you've got your cans and maybe each can has a, a carve out or a set aside of rapid rehousing funds to do this, but it, it sits with uh, ideally whoever is doing uh, the shelter intake or the coordinated entry process so that they can immediately do a program enrollment as soon as the, the solution has been identified. So you're able to do the enrollment, get them into um, housing. The other beauty of this is folks, I think are aware that uh, for COC funding, um, uh, you know, for both actually, if you're, once you're in um, rapid rehousing, you maintain your eligibility. So mm -hmm. if that, if you enroll them in rapid rehousing and you provide this really time limited amount of assistance and realize that isn't going to be enough, you can, you can um, offer additional rapid rehousing assistance. I think the guidance is going to be at that point, you would want to do an assessment so that it is then kind of um, further assistance would be in a, a provided in accordance with your written standards, but it's, it's, it's possible to do that, which is, I think, the reason for the program enrollments, if, if that helps. It does. Thank you, Marcy. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have time for really one very brief last question, and then we are, are at the end of our hour yeah. with you, Marcy. Um, the, the quick one that I want to address here is what to do when diversion is not possible and shelter is unavailable. And I think the easy answer to that question is um, street outreach, which varies by community within Connecticut. Yes, I, I mean, that, that is, I would agree with, with that. I mean, I, I think if there uh, isn't a shelter bed available, if there aren't resources to have them um, go into a hotel or motel for the night, um, and there really isn't a, uh, even for one night with a friend or family, um, you know, I think street outreach is the best solution, but I think it's, it's also okay to, you know, there might not be a, um, when thinking about a diversion outcome or placement, you may not have somebody that's willing to have somebody stay with them or commit to having someone stay with them for a month or three months or indefinitely, but maybe you can find somebody that will let them stay just for tonight. Um, mm -hmm. and have the person come back tomorrow. So just, I wouldn't uh, have it be all or nothing. And, you know, even if you can find a safe place just for tonight, that is good enough um, until uh, additional support can be yep. uh, and located. That, and that can still be considered diversion, yes. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Marcy, for your time and preparation for today. Um, that closes out our hour and I hope that everyone was able to learn um, a little bit about the practice of shelter diversion, um, why we do it and what we do. Thank you all of you for joining us. I want to let you know that um, the conference is on straight through to the end of tomorrow afternoon. Up next is our keynote, Justice Starts at Home, and we hope you will join us for that as well. Um, a few great uh, works 
workshops available uh, this afternoon as well, people with disabilities and a great ice cream social with our Be Homeful ambassadors. So I hope you can join us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you and for thank having you. me. Thanks, Marcy.